cold November night on my illicit recovery truck that's come to get this incognito car. I get a call about nine o'clock, it's middle of November. Sean, we're here, we need to get car off truck. My name's Sean Barnes and this is my Jaguar XJ12. I've always had a odd taste in cars. I've never been the sort that's chased the Golf GTI. I've liked Saabs, Jags. A lot of my friends say I've got an habit of buying body carriers, <laughs> um, which I sort of get. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've always liked my big saloons. I got into Jags years ago and um, my dad, he had an habit of getting base spec vehicles. He managed to borrow his boss's 94 XJ and I'd never seen anything like this in my life and you know I've only been you know that car was probably you know seven years old at the time. I got in this Jag and I was just absolutely in awe and I thought I'm going to have one of these one day and uh, my first one I bought legally on the road insured at 19. I think it might have been my gran as a main driver or something along the lines, but I had my first 700 quid XJ at 19 and I've had sort of, this is my fifth. <laughs> 2017 when I bought this, I'd been trawling through eBay, stumbled across it, and it looked like it had had a lot of work done. Sure enough, I've been to and fro in with the guy and we were pitifully, as I do like a bargain, haggling over 50 quid. And it got to the point where the chap just decided to ignore me, even though I'd finally bowed to give him this extra 50 quid on the car. And he, he just wouldn't deal with me. So off a separate eBay account, I had to get my friend to buy the car and get it transported up to Leeds incognito. I still had the email address for the chap who, um, who we got the car off. Um, and I waited till the car were done before emailing him the images back across. <laughs> I didn't get a response. <laughs> There's a tuning company in Germany called Arden. Um, it is like what AMG was to Mercedes before Mercedes bought AMG. Arden do this amazing Series 3 called the AJ4. It doesn't have any of the modern bumpers we might like mine. It is a classic XJ in its purest form but it's gnarly, it's wide, it's in your face, and uh, you know, they, they, they do focus all on your neutrals, and when you look at one, it's just got that wow factor, and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna build one of these. Obviously, looking at my old gold XJ with um, primed wings at the time, it took a bit of foresight <laughs> to uh, have that vision, but I had, in my head, I'd looked through all their range, I'd seen a black, I thought, I'm gonna build this black XJ and uh, yeah, just went a little bit off-piste. <laughs> There's two big phases to the restoration with this car. Initially, when I first built the car, it ended up being painted black beforehand and eventually got an M60 D30. I started out with the intention of having this car on the road in a year, and I've always been able to turn a car around quick. I just never quite anticipated what a long road I was about to go down. This car's come to me, it's a cold November night and on my illicit recovery truck that's come to get this incognito car, I get a call about nine o'clock, it's middle of November. Sean, we're here, we need to get a car off truck. Gone down to the right, we'll assess what I've bought because I've never seen it in person. <laughs> and We've got the car off the truck, it's been filled with rubbish. <laughs> There's no fuel tanks in it. The brakes are seized solid. We've had to sort of literally drag this thing off the truck and realise that, that there's a load to get on with. First part of course, sort of we, we got the car in the workshop. These run a really unusual twin tank fuel system. So in each rear quarter, you've got a fuel tank. There's some covers below and you withdraw the tanks down. And is the craziest switchover system you've seen in the world and I needed to know if this V12 run or not and um, by some pure miracle because I couldn't find any images of how this fuel system went together we eventually got it running and it, the 12 sounded well and my gut feeling was it would be hiding some horrors 
once I'd been over the basics, got the brakes free, I just intended, because the car looked horrific outside and it wasn't a good advert for business, I decided I'm going to sort this bodywork first. That weekend I decided to paint the car over Christmas was, it couldn't have gone any worse. It had snowed, it was a, over the three days, I think we had like a minus four to sort of plus two. Um, so it were absolutely freezing and obviously paint blooms when it's too cold, so which is not ideal. So we had this little space heater, I'm chasing it round the car. And once the heat started getting into the building, we're having condensation dripping down from, from the roof. It was just one of them things where you think, I really should have been more patient in doing this. And I, I just get that eager. It was one of them things where I just felt we needed to really get on and make an impact with it. The final build process to what the car is now must have started probably around 2020. The, the way I've approached this was try deal with every single issue that I've encountered over the last three years and deal with it once and for all. Ended up pulling the engine, the B30 out here and got the car back home because I've always had this situation where the car needs to roll out the workshop Monday morning, whatever I've done. I knew I needed subframes off, things like that. So I know when you've got a garage, it seems crazy going home and ripping a 1980s British Leyland product to pieces in your garden, but that's the way it went. And fell on a very, very low mileage B40 M60, and everyone selling an engine on eBay is selling a very low mileage engine. <laughs> on this particular engine, they were still silver, and you could tell it had not had a paint, they were chipped, you know, they were a little bit tired. Thought, do you know what, there's a fair old chance this is a 60,000 mile engine as the chap's claiming. And we um, purchased it, it cost a lot more than my last one, but I felt for a genuine low mileage unit, it was worth it. And that was, that was the start of, well, a lot of spending. <laughs> back home and decided right it needs to go on air and for me the whole thing with this car and air it was never about just being able to say the car's on air it the car needed to be functional there's not one route home i can take from work to home without a speed bump it's from, from where we are it's just not possible so as you can imagine series 3 xj there's no air kit <laughs> so it's very much been a case of order bits out at US, does it work, don't it work? And, you know, we got there and took the opportunity while the car were at home, completely gutted the bay back to a completely naked, empty bay. At the time, I was undecided on what colour the car was going to stay. Best bet here, black the engine bay. Don't matter if I go bright green, a black bay works with anything. Jags are a well, quirky, to say the least. Without boring everyone to death, there's something called unsprung weight. And the way that works, anything below your coil spring, your wishbones, your hubs, is unsprung weight. And when you hit a bump, how much weight's there basically dictates the amount of rebound you're gonna get and recoil. Um, so Jaguar had this great idea where the rear brakes were gonna be put next to the rear diff to reduce unsprung weight, which means you look through your rear five spoke wheels, there's no brakes there, just a little aluminium hub, which looks, well, stupid. Like I've said earlier, I've had this fascination with noticing how vehicles share platforms. And I remember once being under an Aston Martin DB7, and I realized looking at the architecture, this isn't an Aston Martin, this is a Jaguar. And this was years ago, I'd realised this little quirk and um, I thought, I'm going to start looking into this a little bit deeper and it turns out the DB7 was designed by Jaguar to be a Jaguar and they called it at the last minute and as Ford owned both marks, it was then passed over to Aston and Ian Callum give it the Aston Martin look and that was great for me because that meant all these as the DB7 developed from being a Jaguar to an Aston Martin at the very late 2002 stage, they started putting some very good parts on it. 
and these enormous bricks, I knew I could make work on my <laughs> prehistoric old saloon and sure enough, the rear's direct fit, no bother. To be blunt, the fronts were a shit show, but I got there. The, eight, the new B40, we made all the manifolds, I ended up removing half my boot floor to build this big Valvetronic exhaust system so it's switchable between loud and quiet and you know, not these crap cutouts that go under, turn down under a car and you're getting all carbon monoxide trying to kill everyone inside. You know, it comes out both tailpipes at all times, true valve system. I say the compromise was half of my boot floor disappearing, but when you're in exhaust firm, your exhaust's got to be right. The biggest thing that had bugged me about this car was the fit on the bumpers and the front one. It, I, I had to find a way around it and the solution I come up with was that big rounded shape to the bottom of the wing. I was going to cut my wings in half and have the, have the bumper sit under it and that means I'd have an absolutely seamless finish where the bumper meets the wings and sure enough cut the bottoms off both wings and we just basically fabricated an edge around the bottom and it was then just quite simply a case of mounts on either and then trimming the rear end of the bumper and adding a false lip down the corner where the uh, where the wheels are and that was the point once my front bumper was on and fit I knew I could make this car nice. The colour choice was even by the time the car was in primer, I was so indecisive on colour. My heart wanted black. Um, I sort of have a diesel XJ I run as a daily that's in sort of ultimate black. And I, I really wanted it to match my other one. But I know how I don't keep on top of the swirl marks on my other one. And I was so destroying it the, uh, if this ended up in the same scenario. And I'd, I'd got down to the point where there were, there were four colours for this car. I really liked the idea of a white and black combo, so looking at a Ford pearl white that I thought looked really amazing and the painter managed to talk me out of it based on the fact that it could look like a wedding car. Uh, the, I completely get his reservations and I still think to this day maybe I should have gone white because white, gloss, black trim, it works. Um, the other sort of couple of colours, obviously Ultimate Black I've mentioned, uh, there was a colour called Alfa Romeo Lipari Grey, uh, truly amazing colour and there's what she's finished in now which is JLR Carpathian and this is a modern, a modern JLR colour. If you order a brand new Range Rover today you're probably going to get charged three grand more to have it in Carpathian, it's probably the best selling colour they do and I thought I need this sinister look but I need paint I can maintain, you know, as much as I like my cars, I don't enjoy cleaning things. The main bulk of the interior in this car is original. Um, I've always been the sort of person that loves to have a go at turning me on to anything when it comes to a car. And like everyone, if I don't know how to do something, I look on YouTube and I'm not ashamed to admit it. And I've never touched interiors in my life and especially not dyeing leather. So I watched a mountain of videos and thought, do you know what, I'm doing this. It's what's worse that can happen. I ruined some 30 year old seats that smell a bit funny. Got all the interior out and the brilliant thing is about a car of this age, everything splits down into a million pieces. The original design of this car dates back to 1968. It's how things were done then. And even down to the door cards, you can split these things into a million pieces. You know, you're a wooden board, a bit of leather over um, and a primitive sort of bit of metal shape work. To have a go at dyeing this leather and put this dye down it looked terrific and I was looking at it as if it was a paint and you know the way it reacts and it just looked to be sat on the surface I'm thinking I've ruined this I've absolutely ruined it and sort of nipped off to get my hair cut come back and the, the leather had just drawn the dye in and I'm thinking hold on this has got some legs and we literally got through the the full interior on the car from a horrible cream to a bright gnarly red and it was just a case of getting some front bucket seats for the front and I decided on 
I needed an Android unit in this car. Not much drama, you wouldn't think, but with the way my car's designed, you'd have a single dim radio in the bottom. It then pulls back on itself and up, little trip computer and a few switches. If you move this full assembly out, there's a heater box directly behind it. So I had that much space to get an Android unit in and um, a double DIN at least. So the, the way it ended up being redesigned, all the buttons for the switchover system went where the radio was and I managed to get this super thin, I think it's a VW sort of Chinese replica radio, but it's stupid thin. And I ended up, because obviously this is all set in a veneer on originally on the car so primitively i've cut all sorts of bits of steel up to to make this shape for the car where it all looks in and fits but obviously it was an absolute mess and it was then just a case of take that out send it to laser cutters make me that and you know manage to get away with it and it's probably only one in the world with a double din located where where mine is you know it's just that crazy the the concept of doing it in the space you have no one's no one's sort of gone that far in true British fashion, literally every British car in BL era had seven inch round dome headlights. So that were nice and easy. Defenders, minis, you can just get them. The inners, 5.75 inches. So I then spent a frantic amount of time looking, which you can get all sorts of different lights in 5.75, but I needed two sets to match. And I found these ones listed as Harley Davidson headlights in the correct size that I could also get the sevens in that also matched. And um, the only straightforward mod on the car, quite possibly. The grill probably worth mentioning. You, you can't buy a grill for one of these. Um, everyone is a single slatted aluminium grill. It's just so you know, for this car, you cannot buy anything off the shelf that's modified. That's the way it is. You know, you don't modify a Jag. <laughs> um, you know, it's not allowed, purists hate you. Um, you know, there's no market for it, which is understandable. So my idea with this grill was, so an XJR is a supercharged Jag. It's the M5 against the 5 series sort of concept, if you don't know. They've always been pretty subtle in the way they change up an XJR from an XJ. Simple things, the chrome goes, got a set of wheels only the XJR has, and the only other subtle change was these big slatted grills become a mesh grill. The way I approach this situation, I principally cut all these slats out, smoothed it out, these are made of aluminium, and we sort of filled and shaped this edge and essentially mesh behind them. I found with this car more than anything, you've just got to be willing to give something a go, and it's the only way you can make different when there's no market there to support you, and some things work. Some things don't, you know, the amount of stuff I've bought for this car thinking this may come off and work and it don't always, it really doesn't. Like there's a sort of few times I've got lucky, managed to get a late XJS steering rack, which was using BMW technology at the time. Um, and that's just completely transformed the steering of the car. It feels like a BMW sort of steering. Obviously, you know, the rack that were on these dates back to 68 and power steering technology was primitive <laughs> you know it's it's giving it a sporty real sporty feel and you know that's what you're chasing yeah i've not really had many big boo-boos with the car well i wouldn't say it's a massive one but it was just my own stupidity really obviously with it being aired out coming on and off a ramp you know you, you've got to lift it up as you do you know so for the last couple of years all i've been doing every single day is lifting this car up driving it off this ramp well every day i've been at work a uh, bit of a busy morning about three weeks ago thought well i had back at car up and not the front and there's this bumper's totally custom and one off of course it was the thing that i'd end up taking <laughs> taking the big hit as the nose caught onto the top of my ramp boards the bumper this originally was would have added indicators here um yeah needless to say cracked all the way around there the custom end i'd made had ripped off and I bent the thing. And luckily, the painter ran across the road, managed to sort of get this sorted within a week. I've always felt my true proud moment with this car was, we ended up in this mad scenario where fast car have agreed 
to have this 1987 Jag on their stand at tracks. I've never taken a car to a car show. Don't get me wrong, I've done things like the Leeds crew, stuff local where you just nip in for a, a chat, but you know, true big car show I've never done. And sort of thought of having this on the organizer's stand, I'm thinking, you know, I hope this car's, you know, gonna go down well. You know, as, as most people know, people don't mess with Jags. People definitely don't mess with old Jags and people don't really appreciate or know anything about them. So I'm thinking this is either going to work really well or go down like a lead balloon and first proper trip out in the car as well. You know, I've only ever driven it local, so it got us there with no drama, which is amazing. And uh, we, we've, we've had it on display at tracks and the reception it got were amazing. You know, for all this work, most people just think this car's two generations newer than what it is and don't realise what it is. For those of you who don't know, Margaret Thatcher, we're getting taken to Downing Street in one of these. That's what this car is. And it wasn't just all the people who were interested. You know, there were younger people looking at it and you know, I've never seen anything like this. And to my disbelief, it placed in sort of top 10 out of 4,000 cars, which, you know, you're thinking when you look at some of the standards of the vehicles that are there, that is just colossal. You know, and I, I've always been critical of the car. Any little niggle, you know, I. I only ever see the bad in the thing, never, never, the, you know, I never look at it from other people's perspective, you know, when you know where the little niggles are, um, you know, that's all I've ever looked at and, you know, to have people really going over it and like, wow, you know, this is totally original, we've never seen anything like it and, you know, it were, it were genuinely just nice to see the car be appreciated by people, because I'd never, when I started building this car, I'd never built it to be a car that's liked by the masses, I like Jags, that's me. You know, like my business partner, big VW man. Um, and I've always been setting my own ways. I don't care what people think that's, you know, even sort of dating back to when I were, sort of had my first one at 19, you know, stick I'd get for that when my friends were in 106s and Corsa Bs, it were, but one of them, I didn't care, I in a big 3.2 Jag with air con and electric windows. You're winding your windows and you're getting rained on. It's, it's one of them things and, you, you just find there's even something like this isn't truly appreciated in the Jag circles, as you can imagine. Purists want to lynch me. It is unbelievable. Um, they, they've all got this idea that you've ruined a good car. They never turn it on its head and, well, actually, you saved a turd that you know, you'd have been eating your beans out of by now. That's, that, that's never the way it's looked at. And I think the biggest upset point is a German engine in a British car. You know, British people, generally speaking, <laughs> we're, we're a proud nation. And uh, yeah, to, to take somewhere that's sort of out of Brown's Lane and put a German engine in seems to be like the ultimate sin. Genuinely hope this sort of car inspires people. You know, I've, I've, I've never tried telling people it's easy and you get everything right first time. But I hope you know, from people looking at the images of what the car was to what it is now, that it inspires them when things aren't quite going right on a build to push, to push, achieve. You know, you can do that and you, you just can't let a car beat you sometimes. And, you know, like I think this thing's testament to that gritty sort of mentality. And you always find perseverance with any build is needed and you know there's been times with this where I thought I wish I'd never started and you've just got to find find that drive and you'll you will end up with something you really enjoy. Caltech we opened May 2016 and me and my business partner Kelvin worked together at a, another exhaust place local to here and I was his apprentice once upon a time you know we, we'd been here building exhaust systems with a sort of quality focused attitude. And we got the XJ a year into the business and starting a big project car, well, try to get a business off the ground is probably not the smartest thing you can do. But at the same time, it's been brilliant for this place, it has. And you know the way the car gets recognized about and it's now at the point where I'll see random pictures turn up on Facebook at car when I've been out somewhere, cars parked up, and the amount of times where you get tagged is phenomenal. And you know, I almost feel like the cars become part of the place. We, you know, we've got a Ford Ranger that Kelvin runs, and it's the same sort of thing. And the the thing I enjoy most is 
when you see where kids react to it um, with this or the truck and you, when, when you just see that true amazement in a kid's face and you say, oh, come on, have a look. And I remember being that kid myself and you know, I've always felt however tired, rushed, in a bad mood you are, if a kid comes up and just wants to have a quick chat with you about a car, you've got to do it because that, that's an experience they're always going to relate back to. And you find sometimes it's them odd memories that stay with people throughout life. And, you know, you've, you've got to let them kids have that opportunity. And, you know, that's how the next generation of car lovers will be born. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of people go wrong, where just brush it aside as, you know, you, you, you can't be like that. And, you know, you, we've all got to remember we were that excited kid sometime. And, it's it's just the way I feel, you know. You you you've, you've got to got to engage with cars. It's it's what brings us all together. It's what meets are about. And you know, there's a lot of negativity around the broader car scene, and everyone's wanting to one up everyone, and that's not what it's about. And you know, we we should all be able to just go talk about what we love, no nastiness, and you know, just be able to. Be yourself around people of a like-minded nature and fingers crossed you know if, if everyone just uses that same sort of attitude you know the car scene as a whole will be a better place for it So at Caltech, we 90% of what we do is we build stainless steel exhaust systems, and you know pretty much we we most things if it'll fit in the building and you'll pay for it, we'll build you it. This year particularly, uh, some decent supercar builds, um, R8 V8, R8 V10. Um, you know they're very they're a very intrusive job. You know we we genuinely make exhaust to the highest standards. It's not just that side. You know we see everything from Rolls-Royce Dawns to Rover 25s. You know, we, we, we cater to everyone and we've never been one of them that have said, I've gone into business to be the cheapest exhaust guy in the world. We've not, you know, we, we focus on quality. That's what we're about. And, you know, that doesn't mean we're gonna be earth shatteringly expensive. Um, you know, we try cater for everyone. You're ever in a situation where you just want to nip in for a chat, nip in and see us. You know, we, we are a friendly bunch.